Good afternoon and welcome to Across the Fence. I'm Keith Silva. We hope that when you tune into our program, you learn something new about Vermont. The same goes for producing the program. We're curious too. And boy oh boy did we learn something a couple of years ago when we visited with a local Burlington historian who brought us the story of Lumiere North America and autochrome color photography. As they say in television, but wait, there's more. We've invited Hugo Martinez Cazon back to the program because there is indeed more. Hugo works with as an environmental engineer for the state of Vermont, and it was through his time with the state that he became interested in the, in the lost bit of history. Welcome back to Across the Fence, Hugo. Thank you, Keith. Um, I know the U Lumiere brothers as pioneers of cinema, for which I should note as a, a, a cinema movie fan, uh, they said there was no future. Um, it's good that they stuck to the uh, creation of things and not the uh, uh, continuation, I guess. Um, what was their connection between these two brothers from France and little old Burlington? Well, um, they created a factory here. Uh, it was called Lumiere North America Company. It's down Park, oh, well, Flynn Avenue mm -hmm. used to be called Park Avenue. <laughs> so if you go down Flynn Avenue, almost at the waterfront, uh, right after the railroad tracks is the factory, the Lumiere North America Company. Mm -hmm. And they created that factory to uh, make black and white color um, dry plates mm -hmm. as well as x-ray plates and to stockpile and sell uh, cinema film, mm. which they were very world famous for, uh, for all of that. But they invented color photography right. in Lyon and uh, manufactured the earliest autochrome here in Burlington as well. Why Burlington? Why not Chicago or New York? What, what is it about this? Well, that's, that's a really good question because they did look at these big cities mm -hmm. and that would be the natural choice. Right. But uh, Burlington was a town of 18,000 people. It had a chemical industry of dyeing for wool and cotton, mm -hmm. but primarily they had a really large uh, French-speaking population where they could keep tabs on the secret of the new development that they were coming up with, autochrome, right. and, uh, and be able to keep communication going really smoothly with the factory back in Lyon. Yeah, I guess one of the things that gets sort of lost in this, at least for me, I concentrate more on the film part of it and the historical part, but we're talking about cutting edge technology. This is along the lines of anything that we would consider cutting edge today as far as mechanical, we'll get into that in a minute, but this is, this is the highest of high tech. Oh yeah, yeah, autochrome was unbelievable. It was unexpected, unknown, uh, and most people in the US think of color as being Kodachrome. Mm -hmm. Kodachrome didn't happen for 35 years after autochrome, so this, this revolutionized the world. Right, people were literally seeing in color. Mm -hmm. um, okay, now that we're caught up, you've got some new information, yeah. you've learned about, uh, some, some more people who are central to this process. Who can you tell us about? Well, uh, one uh, person that we can talk about is uh, Francis Dublier. Mm -hmm. He was a foreman at the factory. And so uh, this is a great story that would take many hours, but <laughs> in a nutshell, um, the his, his, uh, professors in Montreal that I met introduced me to a, a PhD candidate that had done her PhD on Francis Dublier. Um, studying at the Eastman uh, Foundation, mm -hmm. Rochester, and the City of Paris universities. Her name is Clara Eau Claire, and they put me in touch with her. We were talking, and I said, well, you know, from 1900 to 1910, like, what do you have for Dublier? And she says, well, I don't really know what happened. Do you have anything about this guy? And I had researched the name of some workers, and of course, I had him as a foreman. Mm -hmm. She put me straight that this was the same man. Uh, he, pr prior to being here, he shot the first film of the coronation of Nicholas II in mm -hmm. Russia, 1896. Mm -hmm. The first time film was shown 
you had to turn it by hand. Right. He is the one that actually turned <laughs> the machine. And so that guy came here and worked here for nine years, and he's heralded in 1915 as the pioneer of cinema in the United States. Mm. So that's 1915. Right. And what, what the reason for that is that after he worked in Burlington, he stayed in the U.S. and went to Fort Lee, New Jersey, where current, current knowledge of cinema history is that that's kind of the birthplace right. of early cinema in the United States. Right. He established some of the studios and the factories and into the 1920s, he was world renowned and had spent prior to that 10 years, almost 10 years here. Just the foreman. <laughs> Just well, the he wasn't right, the foreman, right, right. yeah. He was a good yeah. choice for foreman, let's <laughs> yeah, say that. Yeah, it was exactly. a good choice. Um, you also have been researching some female photographers. Tell us about Clarissa Hovey. Sure. Uh, yeah, I mean, I like talking about her because uh, oftentimes people think that there weren't a lot of women photographers. Mm -hmm. And actually, uh, photography, uh, the men in the photography world were saying, no, this is a gender neutral profession, which was pretty advanced for the day. And, Not uh, the language they used, I'm sure, but... <laughs> yeah, no, yes, no, they, yes, they, yes. they said it's a gender neutral okay, profession. Okay. They said it, uh, yeah. And, uh, but... Um, when I was looking at Francis Dublier's information here mm. to figure out where he lived and right. that, that it, confirming that he did live and work here, um, he's listed on the same page as Susie Dotty. Mm. Susie Dotty was a local woman photographer. So there were, you know, even in a village of 18,000 people, there were two women photographers that had their own studios. Wow. Yeah. So Clarissa Hovey had a studio in downtown Boston on Boylston Avenue, and she, the color photography became a product in 1907. So Antoine Lumiere, the father, uh, came to do a product launch in Boston, and all the major people were there, and Clarissa Hovey was just down the street in Boylston Avenue at her studio. So she started taking photographs in autochrome. She has a great article that I read uh, where she would take portraits of people, but she would always, ha always have a camera read at the ready with autochrome. Mm -hmm. And while people were kind of relaxing, uh -huh. she would take a picture of them in autochrome and sell it to them. So mm -hmm. she ended up in a year uh, creating an exhibit, exhibit of 200 autochromes. Mm -hmm. So, and she's very little known. I mean, Helen Messing uh, Murdoch, um, is famous because she traveled around the world taking right. autochromes. But right. it was the first time that people could see the world and share it with others and say, well, this is what Pakistan looks like. Right. Uh, right. So um, um, photojournalism uh, came out of autochrome because you could, it, it's so much more compelling. If I say to you, World War I, right. uh, you have a black and white image. Yes. But autochrome allowed people to take autochrome pictures in color mm. of World War I. Right. So right. that's kind of the Im importance of color and women as photographers. Well, we sort of are talking about this like it's not in the room. You have a reproduction here. This isn't a plate, an original or no, autochrome no, plate or anything like that. <laughs> but this is sort of what we're talking about. Adam, uh, right, our director can get an image of that. I think if we've got it straight enough, Adam. Um, but you can sort of see that this is sort of the quality of the color that we're talking about here as far as you know, the image. And you said uh, this woman only became famous a couple of years ago. Tell me the story yeah. quickly. Well, Ugo. nobody remembered that autochrome existed. And this uh, photograph, along with others of the same person, um, were unknown. But when autochrome became rediscovered, quote unquote, mm -hmm. people started posting things online and this museum posted this picture by O'Gorman, Mervyn O'Gorman. And Christina is the name of, of the model. And when the photograph came out, it's so clear, it's so much better than the early Kodak that people were blown away. And she became uh, really well known and nobody knew what her name was. So <laughs> Christina is her name. Right. And she, she became a, a renowned model, right. uh, although she's probably been dead maybe 80 years. <laughs> right, right. Um, we were talking earlier about how cutting-edge technological the autochrome process was. 
you found something recently about an announcement in a British newspaper about the technical aspect. What did you discover? Uh, well, I mean, the, the only factory uh, that the Lumieres had was uh, outside of Lyon was here in Burlington. So the significance of the factory is that this is the only one outside of mm -hmm. France. Right. And they were making the plates in inches. And that made it possible to sell to the markets um, like Great Britain England, that, were, that were in inches. Right. And so the, the irony was that the plates that were made in <laughs> Lyon couldn't be sold in, fr in, in London because they wouldn't fit in the machine, in the, fact, in the <laughs> right, um, right. cameras. Right, right. But they solved that problem by having the, the factory in, uh, in, in Burlington, in the States, that yeah. could do it on the, 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 the standard scale. I can't remember what the, the original uh, scale was that. Um, we've just uh, got a couple more minutes left. What happens to the factory? You've got the, you know, all of a sudden it just ends? Well, the factory, let's remember, had 150 workers, almost 200 workers, okay. primarily women, Burlington women. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was celebrated uh, when the 300th anniversary of um, Champlain coming uh, happened. There was a big to-do and a huge uh, displaying of, of um, autochrome, photos. autochrome photographs. Mm -hmm. So it was very, very important. Uh, the factory closed because the, the importation tax for gelatin went up mm -hmm. and it didn't make economic sense anymore to, to run the factory uh, that way. So um, they went back to making the factory, uh, the plates in Lyon and importing them mm -hmm. and the, this factory was uh, redundant so mm -hmm. they closed it down. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, a great piece of, of Burlington history. Uh, I think we've barely scratched the surface. <laughs> I know we barely scratched the surface. We were talking. Um, thank you very much, Ugo. It was very nice to meet you and to hear some more about this. And uh, I know you've got some articles in the Vermont History Magazine that'll mm -hmm. be coming out that further I elucidate hope. this process. Yes, fingers crossed, <laughs> fingers crossed. Um, well, as they say in the movies, that's a wrap. My thanks to everyone here at WCX who made today's program picture perfect. And as always, thank you for stopping by Across the Fence.